It is such a thrill for me to be here on this stage. Um, I've been coming to the Asia Society since I was a very small boy, mostly because of the incredible programming that um, Rachel has put on, um, and it's a thrill for me to be here. Also because it's uniting two of my primary passions. Um, as Rachel said, I, I spend my days these days as, a, as an urbanist, thinking about um, what makes cities vital, what makes cities just and equitable, but my training um, was originally as a visual artist, um, and I'm a filmmaker, and I, I get to talk about art and culture in some contexts and urbanism in others, and I'm really delighted for this opportunity to be able to talk about them both together with our esteemed panelists um, who are going to come up and present uh, one after the other some of the things that they're working on, and then we're going to have a very wide-ranging conversation about culture and cultural vitality, what cultural vitality means in the context of cities and urbanism, what are the opportunities, but also what are the responsibilities of our cultural institutions um, to the publics that they serve and to the uh, cultural producers whom they um, exhibit, nurture, cultivate, etc. Um, we're going to start from somebody close to home. Alex Poots is the founding artistic director and CEO of The Shed. For the last 20 years, Poots has commissioned and presented a wide range of leading artists. Prior to joining The Shed in 2015, he was CEO and artistic director of the Manchester International Festival, as well as artistic director of the Park Avenue Armory. He's worked with an incredible list of artists, um, and you can read uh, the full list in your program notes. I won't bore you by reading it here. I just want to point out the fact that it's not that many lists of artists that one reads that have both Abada, Parveen, and Kraftwerk in the same list, um, or Matthew Barney and Zaha Hadid, for that matter. So I think i um, very much looking forward to discussing that as well, the, uh, the blending of, of different kinds of cultural art forms um, and what happens when you bring them together. Following Alex's presentation, we'll hear from uh, Suhania Rafael, uh, taking us a cross oceans to Hong Kong and, uh, and evoking for us a really um, a project that's staggering in its ambition and scope. Uh, she was appointed executive director of the M Plus in November 2016. From 94 to 2013, Rafael worked with Queensland Art Gallery, Gallery of Modern Art. She's led the gallery's flagship project, the Asia-Specific Triennial of Contemporary Art, since 2002, and worked with the APT project since 94 as a curator. As Deputy Director of Curatorial and Collection Development, she was responsible for building up the gallery's contemporary Asia-Pacific collection and took part in major curatorial projects such as the Andy Warhol exhibition in 2007-2008 and the China Project in 2009. And then we will return to Local Shores to New York um, and hear from someone who's bringing, a, has recently brought one of um, the most exciting artists from Asia to our streets and our public spaces. We'll hear a little bit more about that, um, but also more about uh, the Public Art Fund, which uh, he joined as director and chief curator in 2009. Another native of Australia, his curatorial career began there with the Caldor Public Art Projects and later the Museum of Contemporary Art, Sydney. He was contemporary curator at the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford, Connecticut, before moving to Boston to join the Institute of Contemporary Art as chief curator. He's curated more than 50 exhibitions with a wide range of significant international artists at different stages in their careers. And I think we'll talk about that a little bit too, what it means to present work from artists who are not all at the exact same place in their careers, but really uh, represent the diversity of artistic practice across longer trajectories. Um, so I'll leave it there and we'll start off with Alex and then go into Sahania and then finally hear from Nicholas before uh, we have a wide-ranging conversation. Alex. Good evening everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Um, Rachel said something earlier that captured my mind. Um, she talked about civil society. Um, and, and a de democratic sense of civil society. Um, maybe that would be a good place to start. I think more than 10 years ago, lights are very bright. <laughs> I think more than 10 years, I can't see any of you. More than 10 years ago, um, it was decided that a new part of New York would be developed um, by the previous administration. Um, this is a picture of a part of it, but it's like eight blocks of New York. And thank goodness, um, the only things that weren't thought about 
you know, alongside um, offices and apartments, that someone had the foresight to think about a civil society and a democratic one. And within this whole privatized area, a piece of um, public space and a piece of, I should say, actually city-owned space was going to be preserved for arts and culture. And that really is the genesis of the shed. People have said, you know, I think over the years, well, what's it going to do and what's it going to be and what's its purpose? But things evolve gradually. And I credit both the previous and the current administration for having the strength and bravery to actually say, well, we're going to keep that and we're going to do something hopefully good with it. Um, so what are we going to do with this um, kind of treasure? I think you can see it. Um, and very... Um, very visible, but also, you know, transparent. Um, maybe take you back to some of the thinking that attracted me to come and, and work here in America. Um, you know, a little Scotsman then went to London um, and then had this opportunity. But what really interested me was that, you know, I grew up in, in the 70s in a, in a place that had centers of excellence, for sure, in Europe as there are in America. Um, but I couldn't understand why as a young trumpet player and as a young composer, people would you know, applaud my classical trumpet prowess and think that you know, the stuff I would do in jazz clubs and in pop bands was somehow diminished in some way. It, it all seemed to me to be important. Um, and I think that was probably the genesis of um, the practice that I learned from many great impresarios, whether it's Nick Sarota or the great Gérard Mortier, or there's countless ones, um, many I've not mentioned. Um, but this sense that there is great art in every walk of life. Um, there's also terrible art in every walk of life. But, um, but there is great art, and to call it high and low is, I think, quite difficult, you know, because it becomes societally um, judgmental um, and and often the low art is made by people who have come to their practice in a different route and and I think you know I've always said is a great Schubert song greater than a great Leonard Cohen song you can't really compare them they're both phenomenal songs so that's kind of the background to what interested me with what Liz and David were doing with this building under the guidance of our great chairman Dan Doktorov. This sense that there would be a place, finally, a place that was not a center of excellence for one particular art form, either a great museum or a great concert hall or a great venue for concerts or a great theater, but this would be a place where um, art, all art forms and therefore art, the great artists from all art forms could be present. Um, the bit to the I guess the vision that I brought was not just that, but the idea that this should be a commissioning house. This should not be a presenting house. What's the difference? Well, a presenting house is what's rolling through town. Very important that um, a great city should see that. And we are very well served in that area by great and honorable institutions such as Lincoln Center and BAM, you know, who do both that and, and produced work. But they serve us very well. There would be no point in the shed trying to do that as well because we'd be in competition with them. And the shed very much wants to be complementary. So what I set out our stall as is that we would be a commissioning house for the great artists from all walks of life. And therefore, for audiences, curious audiences from all walks of life. I've always believed that you know, if you put, you mentioned her earlier, if you put an artist like Abda Parveen in a, in a performance, then you have a chance of, it, of welcoming her audience. We once did a show where we actually had Abda Parveen with the great and late, sadly late, John Taverner, the composer, and actually there was audiences from both area. Not a reason to do it, but a wonderful um, additional benefit. So that gives you a little sense of, of, of what our mission and, and vision is, really. Um, I thought I might just take you through a few images. And here's an, um, the first image of you know, construction. Um, I've, I've just given you the mission. But this is what it looks like. We're at the top of the High Line. Um, so we have um, our neighbor at the bottom of the High Line, the Whitney, and then all of the incredible um, resurgence, or surgeons, I should say, of 
uh, visual arts galleries, and and then there's the, the home of the kitchen that's been there for a while. Um, so we we bridge that uh, that area, and we're at the top of the highland as you see it curving round there. Um, we have there will only be one permanent commission in the shed, and it's by a local artist called Lawrence Wiener, one of the great conceptual artists. And he has made this piece, which you'll see is embedded in the paving called In Front of Itself. Um, the rather remarkable thing about the shed is that um, to answer the question, you know, if we're trying to do all art forms, well, not all art forms exist indoors. So here is a good example of the shed shut. So we can do outdoor work on our on our plaza. We can then open it as as you can there. And this outer shell um, really is is one of the most flexible spaces. Um, before I get onto that, I'm just going to take you quickly through the building. Um, so you'll see at the top there we have a rehearsal uh, space and an event space at the top. And then something which I was very passionate about initiating from the very start, in fact, we agreed to it before I signed my contract, was that there would be um, a dedicated space on the top of that building called the lab. And the lab is for early career artists from the five boroughs of New York. It's the only part of the, the shed that is dedicated to one thing and 365 days a year. And that will be our lab for local early career artists. And that, and that we're starting that program um, to look, look for artists, we'll be starting that probably next year. I should have said at the start that we're due to open in spring 2019, so there's still about an 18 month wait till we start. If you work your way down the levels, there's a 500 seat theater. Um, I'm as interested in intimate experiences as large scale experiences, so one of the great joys of being able to have worked with the architects was that we could not only have a 500 seat relatively large-scale theatre, but that theatre can divide into two fully soundproofed separate theatres um, of about 220 seats. Um, and critically, it can also, uh, you can have uh, a show in one of those theatres and you can rehearse in the other. So we can at, at times have two rehearsal places. Um, very few um, buildings are allowed to have rehearsal space because obviously they're not being productive in the, in the financial sense of course they're being incredibly productive and they're invaluable in terms of creating those precious things called artworks. So I'm very grateful to our board for having been enlightened enough to allow that to happen. Um, if you work your way down you have two gallery spaces. They're two of, again, they're two of the most the, the largest um, spaces that have no pillars in them so that are pillar free. But equally because they're open plan we can divide them up into far more intimate spaces and already um, the artists we've been developing new work with are finding different ways of using um, of using both you know, maximal and minimal um, environments. Um, if we work our way out onto the hall, th this building, for those who haven't seen our video online, it moves out. So it works on railway tracks. It takes an engine the size of about of a Prius car to move what is a building about half the size of the drill hall in the Park Avenue Armory just a few few blocks down. Um, so it's about 45 meters wide, 50 meters long, and about 40 meters high. Um, it's one of the most flexible spaces I think I've ever come across anywhere in the world. Um, it can go from this configuration, where you see the Gallery 2 wall has opened up to allow a 1,300 seating bank to emerge. Um, there are the sail yacht, yachting sail technology, which comes down to make complete blackout. But equally, we can remove all that seating very quickly, and we can have a 3,000 standing more pop arena. Um, and we can then lift the blinds and have a sculpture court, both indoors or outdoors. So it can be climate specific or open to the elements. Um, that means really that there, uh, unless you're looking for you know, a 5,000 standing plus arena. There's very little we can't do in there. I'd say the one area um, that, um, you know, the, we would probably go up into the theater to do a more intimate chamber music environment. And that would be where, where we would change venue. But that's one iteration of it. Um, there's many other images, but I've probably got to rush on. So I'll go up onto the galleries. Um, 
This is a, a very unenlightened looking <laughs> use of the gallery, but it's, it's an image. Um, it's using about half the space there. Um, and um, as you can see, it could be broken down into different sizes. Um, we, if we work up to the theater, this is uh, one half of the theater in a 200 seat configuration. Um, and if we work our way up to the top, this is our artist lab. And so this is our early career uh, artist lab. Um, we didn't want to wait until we open to start our, our work. And as a commissioning organization, uh, our version of, of, of kind of education uh, work is to, we found a community of artists that I've been working with for about five years called um, Flexin Artists. Um, and what we've effectively done is to help them set themselves up as a coherent group and company. Um, these are young um, people from you know, ages, I think when we started them, they're about 17 to 25 years old. Um, many of them were, all of them were self-taught. Um, I would say most of them had had very little opportunity, professional opportunity, uh, or teaching opportunity. Um, but they're all very prodigal in their ability and in their dedication. And so what we did was to support them to create their own company and we've, we've provided, they've become our teaching program and we're working, I'm pleased to say that we've now finished our first year of teaching in four of the five boroughs and as of a month ago, we've moved into the five boroughs where, we, where these artists work with children and, and young and older children and young and kids. Um, from largely, from entirely public schools and from places where op more opportunity would be well deserved. Um, so we focused our energies there. Um, it's highly likely that a number of those kids in the three years that will be in those schools, so this is a long-term commitment, will join the company and will be part of the production in the shed um, in 2019. So I'm just going to leave you now with an image of where we're at in construction. I think, I was saying to a colleague earlier, we've probably gone beyond the point of no return. I hope that's true. And, um, and that's, that's it, that's where we're at about a couple of weeks ago. Thank you all very much for your time. It's fantastic to be here in such eminent company and, you know, part of a conversation about creative cities and culture and cultural production. I want to also acknowledge Kain Lo, who sits on the M Plus board and has been participating in the West Kowloon Cultural District and this very good idea for Hong Kong from the start. And this is a gestation that has taken a long time, but good things take time. So as, um, as Kasim said, I am the M Plus Executive Director. I've just been there a year. Lars Nitvi was the inaugural director who was there for five years before me. So M Plus, this is a rendering of our museum in um, Kowloon, West Kowloon. I want to begin by actually positioning um, the museum and to talk about Hong Kong a little bit before going into the project itself. So this is a, a visual image of the West Kowloon Cultural District, 40 hectares of reclaimed land on Victoria Harbour, quintessential views of Hong Kong Island from West Kowloon, from these institutions that will be built. It um, was a decision made by the Hong Kong Legislative Council to develop a major piece of cultural infrastructure for Hong Kong. And this was a long conversation that it was taking place from the late 90s. And the district itself was funded by a single um, grant given by the Legislative Council of 21.7 billion Hong Kong to what became the cultural, the West Kowloon Cultural District Authority. And Kain sits on the M Plus board, but was part of 
the museum advisory committee that formed what is M plus. M plus is that structure there. All of West Kowloon Cultural Authority is this entire piece of reclaimed land. So it's very, very significant for those of you who know Hong Kong and the price of land in Hong Kong. So this is an image of Norman Foster's master plan, a second go at it, where the principle of the cultural district is that all the transport infrastructure sits in the basement level and the ground floor, ground, um, ground floor is for pedestrian, pedestrian access. Connectivity is very important for any cultural infrastructure development. Over 80% of Hong Kong people do not own cars. They use public transport. We sit, of course, in a city that has incredible international traffic coming in. 70.5 70 million people a year arrive at the Hong Kong International Airport. Over here is the express rail link linking Hong Kong into mainland China. And the expectation is that in the first year, and that, um, that rail link will be open next year, 100,000 people a day. Harbour City, which is just down here, the ferry terminals, 80 million people visiting Harbour City. Now I wanted to give you those um, statistics because in terms of culture, Hong Kong has been a gateway city where people from China coming out, people from the international world going in. And the development of West Kowloon Cultural District was a conscious decision made to change that and make it a destination city through a very serious investment in cultural infrastructure. M plus is one of those cultural institutions on that patch of land and it is a museum. Again, a museum that, um, that was formed with a lot of discussion, three years of public consultation with the community in Hong Kong to find out what did they want on this site. And the first outcomes of those consultation was that they wanted four museums rather than a single museum. And that what, were, what were those museums? A museum of contemporary art, a museum of ink, a museum of design, a museum of moving image. So the museum advisory committee that had gone out to do that consult consultation decided to think about those, those ideas given to them by the people of Hong Kong and recommended instead of doing four museums, cohere them all together and do one major museum. And this is a very large museum, 65,000 square meters in scale, and it includes a collection storage and conservation center and an administration block. And for Hong Kong, it was developed as a museum that was going to look out into the world, a global museum for Hong Kong, a new museum like nothing that exists before. Now, Hong Kong has museums, a number of museums, mo and the bigger museums are run by the government, the Leisure and Cultural Services Department Museums. They have great holdings of Chinese historical work, um, Hong Kong artists in, in the Hong Kong Museum of Art, the film and television um, archives. So there are already a significant number of cultural institutions there. But why is M plus different? M plus is different because this is a museum that is for the 21st century's visual culture, understood to be covering design and architecture, moving image and visual art, using its root in Hong Kong, being authoritative about its East Asian collections, 
looking out into the world. So for the first time, Hong Kong artists will be seen with their international colleagues. And there is no museum for architecture or design or visual art together that position artists and makers and designers in this way. So it's a very unique opportunity. Creative cities, creative architects. Herzog and de Muren designed a very wonderful piece of architecture for M+. I just have a little animation here while I speak to you about the bigger ideas of M+. Because this gives you a sense of what's happening now on site. M Plus has decided with that huge uh, numbers of people that it needs to build an audience base. What is that audience base? How, what does it look like? So one of the first things that Lars did was actually put together a curatorial team to start thinking about not just the collection, but also um, engagement. And to that end, um, M Plus has been um, working through a whole series of mobile M Plus ex exhibitions, pop ups. M Plus Matters, a pedagogic platform of talks, of symposium, most of those also helping M Plus decide how to position its collection building. It's been collecting over 6,000 objects over the last six years amazing collection effort. If people from the museum world are here, they would know that that is an exceptional collection building exercise. Plan to, plan to open in late 2019. That public engagement exercise includes um, M Plus developing what's called an M Plus Rover, a traveling studio that goes out to all schools and community centers across um, Hong Kong, including the New Territories. And each semester, a maker, a designer, an artist works with the learning team to take what we hope will be the growth of the next generation of artists, of collectors, of benefactors, of visitors in Hong Kong to build that audience base for what will be an amazing museum. So this museum is planned to open to the public in late 19. We're hoping that the museum itself will be completed in 19, perhaps the early, early part of 19, in which case we can open at the end, because to bump in a museum of that scale, we need a good nine to 12 months. Collection will sit at the heart of those first exhibitions. I want to show you some renderings museum um, the, that Herzog and Demuron have given us using our museum collection so that you have a sense of what the intern interior of the museum looks like. It's a very Herzog and Demuron building with these cutaways, asymmetrical within what is um, a, a, actually a very symmetrical set of structures, a podium with all of the gallery spaces and a tower. And I'll come back to what the tower um, holds. You, um, it's, it's a very, very porous building. The spirit of inviting people into the building was something that was clearly um, a part of the brief. Sometimes this is a very big challenge for those of us who have to administer museums, but I think it's very important for a new museum of this scale and ambition to invite its audiences in. Upstairs um, are three cinemas, a media thick, a learning center, and a suite of galleries that um, will house collections and special exhibitions. So what does the collection look like? And how did the collection begin? Because it's very, very unusual that a museum begins from absolutely nothing into something. And that's what M Plus actually is. It took, you know, in the six years ago, there were no collections. And the first collections that were formed came from a major donation from Dr. Uli Sig. And these, these collections are of contemporary Chinese art, avant-garde Chinese art, 1,510 works. 
um, donated to the museum, a significant foundational core from which the museum then continued to develop and acquire. As I said, it's very important for us to be the site of, um, of contemporary Asian art in, in the region. But how do we intersect with that international? We've recently acquired a Duchamp collection, knowing that that avant-garde Chinese collection, many of those artists cited Duchamp as a, a, a spirit that they held on to. So we have acquired this collection of Duchamp because we can show Duchamp like no other museum would ever be able to, because this positions Duchamp, recenters, decenters him in a very unique way. So that's how we become a global museum. These are some of our other works in the collection so that you have a, a sense of the scale and scope. Importantly, as you will see, we're working with Southeast Asian artists as well and a deep collection of Hong, Hong Kong makers. Um, important for us to expand the idea of what Hong Kong ma makers are across cinema and into areas like ink. Ink art is a very important regional interest, but has very interesting global consequence. We in fact have a very wonderful exhibition from our collection of ink right now on in our first lab space, which we call the M Plus Pavilion on site. Some of our moving image works. And this is really a tiny, tiny group of works for you to have a sense of the scale. The Kuramata Sushi Bar, and then some of our design and architecture holdings as well. So you can see the um, wide-ranging scope of the collection and the possibilities that these um, works bring to um, M+. We've also recently acquired the Archigram Archive, and Archigram placed this collection with us because they felt Hong Kong was a quintessential Archigram city, which of course it is. Free space. In, it's really great to hear Alex talk about um, performing arts and the, and the synergies between visual culture institutions. So because we sit on a cultural district right beside M plus is what we call free space, which is a black box space that has the facility to have up to 5,000 people in the park or much smaller intimate performances inside. And we have now begun to work very closely with our performing arts colleagues on programming because it makes sense and it is a gift to be able to work together. They're already there. Free space will be open by the time M plus opens as well. So that whole area will come up, will, will be um, engaged at the same time. That's a quick uh, look at the traveling studio just to give you a sense of what that looks like So as it travels out and mobile M plus exhibitions. It, it's been great not to have a building because it's given us a lateral um, possibility to go everywhere and anywhere. And some of the, some images of some what mobile M plus exhibitions look like. Performance, live art has been a, a really important part of thinking about what does a contemporary visual culture institution look like. Thinking about creative cities, this is my last slide, um, I wanted to say that creative cities are not always located in Hong Kong. And we take um, Hong Kong's Venice Biennale Pavilion, it's M plus that takes those artists to Venice, because I think a creative city can be a mobile one. And it's how you engage an artist, where and in which, and in which form. We've done this three times, we're about to embark on our fourth. Finally, the skin of M plus has an LED screen, 65 meters high, 110 across. And we will commission artists, moving image artists, to make work on that screen. So it, it's, a, it's a beacon for, for Hong Kong, but beyond. And we commission artists from wherever, local and global. So I know we will have an interesting conversation. Thank you.
Hi everybody, Nicholas Bohm, Director and Chief Curator of Public Art Fund. Um, so exciting to see the extraordinary new cultural infrastructure that Alex and Sahanya are working on. Um, it made me realize, of course, what Public Art Fund does here in New York is use the city itself as the infrastructure and to invite artists um, to use that platform in different ways. We're celebrating our 40th anniversary this year, um, along with a number of uh, organizations that really responded to the way artists were making their work differently, wanting to move outside of the gallery and museum spaces uh, that was in, happening in the 70s. So, uh, so this kind of period was very generative but of course, New York City has changed enormously over those 40 years. Um, Public Art Fund uh, has as its, as its mission here this idea of, of activating the city, of bringing artists, giving them the opportunity to work here. Um, and it's reflective really of, of core values that I think have been mentioned in, in the conversation to date. Uh, which really, of course, are uh, the basic belief that uh, great contemporary art should be made available to audiences for free and that those audiences be as diverse as possible. And then in addition to that, that a vibrant civic space uh, a, a, a really democratic city should engage and embrace those creative voices and allow them to really participate in the life of the city. Um, and what better artist to exemplify those values and aspirations as the culmination of our 40th anniversary uh, than an artist who sort of uniquely combines uh, an identity as one of the most celebrated contemporary artists in the world and one of uh, the leading human rights activists also um, working and speaking today. Um, and so Weiwei's exhibition is brand new. Um, we really wanted uh, to do a project this year that would uh, expand beyond some of our kind of usual venues and sites around the city that would reach all of the boroughs um, and not, not, you know, really uh, be, be sort of centered only on Manhattan uh, and that it would be something that, that really felt um, and engaged people in a way that only a public art project could do. So uh, Weiwei developed, this just gives you a quick sense of the distribution of the exhibition. There are 320 something sites um, in all boroughs for the show. And it, um, it's called Good Fences Make Good Neighbors, which is a line from the Robert Frost Mending Wall poem, a kind of iconic poem in American literature that it describes a, a, a kind of argument between two neighbors over whether they need a wall between their properties. And it, it's, it's essentially talking about how um, a kind of folk wisdom, a populist proverb can actually mask a lot of prejudice and fear. And, uh, and so Weiwei thought it was um, a great title for this exhibition, which really tries to sort of draw our attention and focus to that in the context of, of course, the global refugee crisis, but also simply the growth of uh, isolationism, nationalism, uh, the exponential rise in border fortifications between countries over the last sort of 15 plus years, really since 9-11 the rise of anti-immigrant feeling. Um, and all of those things are tremendously personal to him. I think having lived himself as an exile now, uh, as he's based in Berlin, but even as a child when his family 
uh, was really exiled within China to the provinces when his father, the you know, extraordinarily important Chinese poet, Ai Ching, uh, was, was uh, suppressed under the Cultural Revolution. So he grew up already as a kind of outsider within his own community. He uh, chafed then as a young man trying to develop as an artist at the impossibility of free speech in China and, and came uh, to the place that he thought must be the place for him because he understood it as the most reviled by the Chinese government, which was New York City. So uh, he, he came to New York as a student, as an immigrant. He went to art school here. He dropped out. He drew portraits on the street to earn money. He you know, had all kinds of, of jobs. Um, and so New York was an incredibly formative place for him. And, and this exhibition, which actually began with an invitation I made to Weiwei about eight years ago, right after I started working with Public Art Fund, uh, because it struck me that the, the public engagement of his practice was so fundamental and that given his experience and life in New York that he would have something very powerful to say. We didn't realize at the time, of course, that when he went back to China he would be confined and his passport taken away and, and that whole um, ugly history. Uh, but when he was allowed to travel again in 2015, I went to visit him in Berlin um, in the fall and in the spring of 2016 he came to New York uh, to, to do sort of a site visit and really think about what he wanted to do and this idea of fences was very much in his mind. He'd been traveling uh, in the Mediterranean looking at refugee camps, of course living in Berlin where a lot of refugees were arriving. Uh, the, this was sort of very um, strongly in his mind, and I think he wanted to develop a, a response to New York City that would take the city not as sort of a pedestal to put a, a, a sculpture on, but more as uh, a what he called a ready-made. That and and speaking of Duchamp, of course, Weiwei, you know, is very influenced by Duchamp, but thinking of the city as a ready-made that he could then organically weave his exhibition into and use the different aspects of the city uh, to, to sort of have the exhibition grow out of the urban fabric. Um, and so this idea of the fence really kind of developed into a series of theme and variations, if you like, on that idea. Here at the entrance to Central Park, uh, the fence becomes a cage, and this work is called Gilded Cage. Um, it, of course, is, is no uh, coincidence that um, a work sort of footsteps away from Trump Tower is gilded. Um, in the press conference, he rather wryly commented in response to a question about whether it, so it was intended you know, for um, our president that um, he said, well, it was made for everybody in New York and, of course, the president would be among those people and that he made it gold so that he hoped he would like it even better. <laughs> but it, it, it's a wonderfully sort of, it's sinisterly beautiful. And I think that's sort of what Weiwei does so well. Um, this whole theme is very confronting but Weiwei has devised the exhibition in such a way that it's immersive, it's engaging. You interact with these works. Um, they're quite beautiful, but they, of course, embody the threat and sense of confinement as well. Uh, what an extraordinary opportunity to work in this location with one of New York's great monuments in one of our sort of iconic public spaces, and I think Weiwei's response has been so beautiful and, and elegant and deft, uh, showing how a, a doorway, in a sense, this great symbolic entrance to New York, can be blocked. But at the same time, he's opened up a passageway through 
the center of the work in this astonishing sort of silhouette of two figures together, which is actually an appropriation from Duchamp, his doorway done for André Breton's gallery in Paris. But it's this polished stainless steel. Uh, so it becomes, of course, an amazing selfie Instagram moment. Um, it was very important to all of us that, uh, as I mentioned, you know, major parts of the exhibition happened outside of Manhattan. And what more potent symbol could there be than the Unisphere in Queens, already the most diverse borough uh, of New York City and one of perhaps the most diverse urban uh, places in the world. And... Um, and he's, he's encircled the globe with this sort of barrier, it's a kind of obstacle course slash hammock. So people are, of course, we've been having this wonderfully warm, strangely warm uh, weather, but people are um, engaging with this work in, in the most sort of playful way. Uh, there's a number of works which really literally um, respond to the architecture of different sites the Cooper Union with this sort of five fences piece. You know, fences attach themselves to existing structures. Um, there's lighting at night. Uh, and, and some of these works are quite subtle. Here you see a rooftop fence on the Lower East Side. Uh, and they're all complemented. Here's a sliver fence between two buildings, actually where he lived on East 7th Street. So it's got an autobiographical sort of element to it as well. Um, and these different, and this is the Bowery, um, these different installations, uh, here we go, the Lower East Side of course was important to him as a historic center for immigration. Um, the Essex Market Building where he's done a banner uh, that sort of uses the flagpoles on the building. Um, bit hard to, uh, so you sort of see um, here, this is a piece called Exodus, and it really shows the flight of refugees um, as they sort of escape and attempt to, to find uh, somewhere safe. Um, the Lower East Side then, um, or uh, another sort of aspect of these, he really wanted to use transportation sites. I think, you know, freedom of movement is something we take very much for granted. Uh, so bus shelter sculptures, these um, uh, you know, mesh fences. You'll see how each sculpture kind of takes the idea of, of a fence, which is really a lattice, if you think of chain link, you know, a mesh, a pulled mesh, or the rope that's at the Unisphere, um, all really explore uh, different ways to, to suggest that. And each of these bus shelters also uses the advertising space for images that he's taken at refugee camps around the world, which are paired with texts that talk about, um, you know, facts and figures of the current plight of refugees or more literary texts. You'll see that he's built in a seat to them as well. So he really loves this idea of kind of urban furniture. Um, these pieces might be regarded as art or they might be regarded just as, as sort of an urban amenity. And these are in downtown Brooklyn, in the Bronx, in Harlem. Uh, so they're really exploring the city. And then there are a number of additional bus shelters that don't have the fence, but there are a hundred of these that just have images, each one different. There are also the Link NYC digital kiosks. So all over the city, those include um, his images. Bus shelter, uh, newsstand kiosks, uh, which feature this work called Odyssey, um, very inspired by um, sort of the freezes on Greek vases, but translating that into this contemporary language. Uh, but you really see him integrating the work into the city. Um, there's a series of, of um, lamppost banners, and they are based on photographs. Uh, here are, these are Ellis Island immigrants from the 19th century. Here are sort of famous refugees through history. Um, and there's also 
contemporary refugees. And he's translated each one of these into an individual portrait banner. There are 200 of them all around the city. Um, they're often sort of clustered around the kind of major installation sites, uh, but they're kind of a wonderful way to explore New York City and see these works, which also is so responsive to the atmosphere, the light, the time of day. Um, so it, it's, um, it's also something that uh, if you want to explore, I encourage you to go to publicartfund.org because there is a fantastic interactive map so you can explore and let you know kind of what's near you and give you more information. So, uh, so there's sort of a case study on our latest project. If you guys will please join me on the stage. Should we? Anyone? Wow, so quite a lot of interesting work. And I think also, as always with this kind of thing, um, the juxtapositions between the context in which you guys are working in, I think really bring into sharp relief um, both the distinctions but also the resonances between, between the different work that we're seeing presented here. We have um, a, new, a new typology, it almost seems, of a kind of cultural institution that breaks down the boundary between public and enclosed, uh, between open and inside. We have uh, a museum that's breaking down boundaries between different genres on new land, which is really quite remarkable. And we have a brand new frame on places that we think we know brought by this artist to our public spaces. But also, I think, something I really appreciated that I, that I hadn't quite fully appreciated until seeing your presentation was the, um, the way it shines a new frame not only on public space, as we commonly think of it in terms of places like Washington Square Park, uh, but also on public infrastructure and really sort of demonstrating um, the ways in which public infrastructure is a public space just by uh, making that kind of intervention. Um, so I think there's a lot, a lot of really sort of fertile ground here to discuss. I want to start with um, something that I, I that both uh, the Sohani, you brought up, uh, I think, quite um, poignantly the, the notion of, a, of an idea of museum for visual culture as opposed to visual art. Mm -hmm. And Alex, you also talked about sort of the distinctions between different kinds of art and how we value them and how we sort of assign cultural value to different forms of cultural production, which of course are bound up in very thorny questions of race and class. Um, so I, I wonder if you guys can speak a little bit about you, how you define culture as something that's a more expansive category than art. I'll have a go first. Just to say that for us, visual culture is open-ended. So um, it's an encounter that we explore as we move on. It's very hard to define. And, and even though we have these categories of design and architecture, moving image, visual art, what we find is that it's very porous and often um, fudgy. It's not necessarily one or the other. It could be all of them in some form. What's been brilliant is to work with a group of curators and educators who, don't, who are unfettered by, by these distinctions. Knowing that in our world today, 21st century living, our, our lived world is so saturated with images, with design, with um, architectural structures and moving images that just, it's the plethora just bombard us. So instead of trying to catalog and discriminate, I think we just embrace. Um, that often leads to, you know, Kain would know, because she's on our acquisitions committee, this discussion about um, what's our roadmap in terms of the collection, what are we saying, how are we, how are we discussing Hong Kong, which has always had that very cosmopolitan, textured city, a city where neon 
is and light sits right throughout um, its its landscape, a density of structure, a concentration of people, these vertical structures. Um, how how do we then respond in in terms of building a collection that reflects that dynamism? while also knowing that we need to develop historical context, the deep reflection and um, a, a space for audiences to think about that lived environment. Hong Kong has one of the, you know, is now the third largest art market in the world behind New York and London, yet it hasn't developed the kind of museum <coughs> infrastructure that balances out ideas of value. And I think, you know, yes, market is a very important part of artist sustainability, without question. But how we value those objects has to be a more complex reflection. And I think M Plus is an ambitious institution seeking to do all of that. Ambitious, absolutely. I think that's, that goes without saying. Um, do you have anything you want to add to that question what, of culture? What is culture and what is yeah. art? So, um, <laughs> for you, maybe not, the hardest not. question. <laughs> I mean, you know, if we look to some of the great thinkers, ranging from art shows us what it is to be civilized, so I guess that's a macro definition, to I think Gerhard Richter once said to me that he thought art showed us what isn't there. That was a beautiful way of putting it. I mean, art's about metaphor, isn't it, really? On one level. Um, you can't... It's about transcendence and find expanding people's minds. I mean, those are things... It's not what they're trying to do, artists, but that the great art can do that. And, and much more. One of my favorite quotes uh, that follows in that line is actually a Duchamp quote, and I think it's kind of interesting. That's mm. another unexpected resonance that mm. I wasn't um, expecting to come up. As he, uh, he once said famously, um, in the future, artists will simply point. Um, and I think there's something about, certainly in uh, Wei Wei's work, that is um, obviously there's, there's an incredible sort of iconic monumentality and sculptural quality to a lot of these things, but that there's something else that simply encourages you. I'm thinking specifically of the one at, near his old building that you showed, um, that simply shining a light on the negative space between two buildings um, in a way that through this very sort of vernacular language of fences that we all kind of associate with whatever we associate it with is pointing out something that has always been there that you just keep walking by. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, um, the banners as well, because they're not printed, they're a mesh. So the image is, is created through the uh -huh. contrast with the background. So. It, it, they can move from being invisible to being visible in a second as you sort of walk down the street where, you know, a slice of sky between buildings suddenly makes it visible. So it, it actually is very much sensitizing you and engaging you with sort of the texture of the city. So you're probably not often in this position, but you're the, your organization is the old guy on the block here, 40 years, <laughs> is that what you said that you're celebrating? Whereas we have these yeah. two sort of brand new institutions that are kind of reinventing the way we think about yeah. visual culture yeah. as, as they go along. Um, I wonder, perhaps starting with you, but then I'd love for all of you to speak to how you see cultural production changing um, some of the new trends that you see, in the, whether it's from a perspective of, of a collections department or whether it's from the perspective of thinking about how to um, accommodate you know, new forms of practice. Uh, and, and how do those shifts um, in cultural production influence your own decisions, all of you as programmers, about the, the programming and also the, the architecture um, in which you present? Well, I think... Um I mean, I'm, my background's as a museum curator. I love museums and, and you know, value them enormously. Um, it's, it's also kind of been a thrill to work in a context um, that is, has sort of very few parallels. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've had this incredible flowering of 
museum culture around the world. Every city has its you know, new contemporary art museum and alternative spaces and all of those sort of things. Um, but the invitation to conceive a public project for New York City is a fairly rare and special thing. So it, it tends to be both daunting and you know, wonderfully kind of inspiring for artists. Uh, so you know, that, that, that often means it takes years you know, to, to have a dialogue that kind of reaches its, its culmination. Um, or you know, it, can happen, it can happen much faster. But it, it, I think it's, you know, most of the artists we work with, uh, I'm very resistant to the idea that there are sort of public artists, mm -hmm. like as if then there are museum artists. Like, right. you know, we often do projects that are actually very complementary with you know, museums. We did officially vice uh, how to work better mural together with the Guggenheim's retrospective. You know, we, we love doing those kinds of partnerships and... Um, but I think artists, you know, at the end of the day, artists want to communicate. And they want to communicate with the broadest possible audience. So what better way to do that than on the streets of New York? Suhania, what do you see as new, new trends in, in the art that you're seeing? I think it's also um, the fact that there are infrastructures being um, put together is um, a sense of responsiveness to to artists and makers. You know, we all work with living artists and makers, which is both a privilege and a challenge. They can go take you in all kinds of journeys, unexpected. Um, but that is, that is the beauty of being able to work in that space. Um, for us, I think moving forward is, is allowing that res responsiveness to be expressed in whatever form it, it takes. But, um, and sometimes, you know, that is, um, that, can, that can lead you through into little cul-de-sacs that are great, but sometimes not always productive. From M Plus's point of view, I think for me, what's most exciting, and this is why I joined the museum, is um, the region within Asia has no museum like this, or no cultural space like this, that formalizes a collection, commissioning, the possibility to work with performing arts curators, uh, 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 an actual district that offers many possibilities. And there is nothing like that in Asia. And we, you know, we are in the 21st century, which many people say is Asia's 21st century. And we need to form a platform to allow and give those artists their, due, their dues. And so for me, that's a very exciting thing to do. It's adding to cultural capital of the world. You mentioned responsiveness. You also mm. um, mentioned earlier the concept of porosity, which I think mm. is a really um, important thing that kind of runs through a lot of the different kinds of work that each of you is presenting. I wondered if you had anything you wanted to say about um, sh shifts that you're seeing or observing in cultural production, or maybe they've always been there. We're just choosing to highlight them in new ways now, but how that influences the decisions that you make, not only about what to present and how to present and what sort of dialogue with other work, but also the architectural choices that you invoked um, about the building. I mean, some of the things I'm going to say are both new and just continuations mm. of previous journeys. But I think uh, uh, a shift to the immaterial mm -hmm. is happening. So what does that mean? I mean, sorry, I sound a bit vague there. but. Uh, um, there being less focus on capital and and you know object, I guess, and more focus on um, uh, a, a, a metaphysical experience, um, something that you can't buy but that's priceless. So is that you know, in a way, a Tino Segal or or a construction by a Tricia Donnelly or a you know, I mean, I don't want to name artists actually because I'll probably not name a wide enough variety. <laughs> but, but, um, but you know, the the sense that, and that actually unifies different art forms. I, I feel that coming from visual artists, but I also, 
you look at even hip hop culture where um, there's a move away from the kind of you know I don't want to essentialize anyone but there has been a slight machoistic sense to some of that work and then someone like a Frank Ocean arrives and there's a very thoughtful multi-layered um, craft making art making I should say um, how, how, do you, how do you think that, that shift to the immaterial, which I totally agree with, how does that influence uh, curatorial and also sort of programmatic decisions about how you create well, an actual space? It's, it's here. It's coming. Mm -hmm. you, you can, I mean, it may not work for everyone's area of work, uh, field, but it's, and it's a response to the socioeconomic condition. Right. So I think it's, and as usual, artists are anticipating the future. Yeah, which I think, I mean, it brings me up, um, for me, Cayenne, you mentioned something that, uh, two phrases that I think are both equally important here, the creative economy and creative ecologies. Um, and I'm thinking particularly, um, Suhania, about the, the, the sort of district mm. um, ecology that's being created, in this case, sort of out of um, whole cloth, so to speak, but there is... Uh, certainly new kinds of opportunities for synergy between different institutions in a district. I mean, um, in New York, we're very privileged that uh, some of our cultural districts, you know, we, we do have the things like Lincoln Center, which were yeah. created there, and a lot of homes were destroyed in order to create that, and communities were ruptured in order to create that. Uh, but then you also have naturally occurring cultural districts like we have in places like East 4th Street, around BAM to, to a slightly more institutional degree. Uh, but the, the ways in which synergies can create, can pop up between different institutions, especially if there is public space, as both of your projects do, and you of course work exclusively in public space, um, that can allow those synergies between distinct practices to sort of come to the fore. Um, and allow people to sort of navigate their, through them. Could you speak a little bit more about the role of the district in, in how you think about M+. How would M+, be different if it was a standalone thing with no other... I, I think the real um, advantage is the fact that it is in a cultural district and it has park, it has public space, it has other institutions that are dedicated to various art forms mm -hmm. um, with professional practitioners that are under the one umbrella. Mm -hmm. So that, that is a inbuilt advantage for all of us working. Um, I do think though, you know, in the Hong Kong situation, we are still exploring what that audience might be mm -hmm. and how we engage those audiences. And we've had a number of M plus, mobile M plus projects that have explored that through a live art project, through the inflation project. We did a Hong Kong neon, neon signs where this where the city itself became our museum, and we looked at neon as a form, a visual culture form, that is disappearing now with digital coming on. And how do we map that? And it was a, um, an exhibition that worked online with the public of Hong Kong to say where, where and we mapped the best neon. And then we got a bus and off we took them to look at it. So the, so the site, you know, it, it's, 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 it has a synergy to the public art fund in the sense that the city is the creative site for that making. But I should also say that Hong Kong is a very fast city, like New York. And slowness is something that we must encourage. Mm. I think it's, a, it's, it's hard to do this, but mm -hmm. it's very important to do it. And I think that's where Formal museum spaces offer that slowness and a slowness to to think and contemplate and reflect, maybe get upset, maybe be challenged, maybe really like and be delighted, or all of those things in in those spaces. And I, I think slowing down is something that I have worked with artists who insist on making projects that allow that. Yeah. And that's a, that's a good thing. Oh, absolutely. I think the, the role of museum as, as refuge is mm. something that we definitely need to protect, mm. especially in places that don't have um, the luxury of tremendous public spaces mm. all around that's them. That's right. Uh, I also, that, that neon project sounds fantastic yeah. and is a perfect example of pointing our Duchampian fingers mm. <laughs> at what is around us and creating a new 
um, frame around it. And I think, I think the, the Weiwei's project also creates moments of slowness and contemplation in places where we wouldn't necessarily expect it. Yeah. I mean, I was going to say, I think, to pick up a little bit yeah. on this idea of sort of the immaterial, um, it, I mean, I've heard the, the phrase used often now, the kind of um, experiential economy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think our experiential uh, work uh, is, is definitely um, sort of something that has a lot of traction and, and I think a lot of interest. I mean, this idea of the immaterial, um, it's interesting to think about that in, in the sort of art historical context. I mean, we had the dematerialization of the art object and Lucy Lepard and the 60s and all of that was very much about sort of privileging the concept and uh, um, and where, of course, right now, you know, in the grip of, like, the most affluent and, and sort of fetishized, you know, um, valuation of our objects that there ever, ever has been. Um, and a lot of the work, I mean, like Weiwei's, is, is still object-based, mm-hmm. but, it, but it's experiential at the same time. So it either maybe gives you a physical experience moving through or seeing yourself differently, or it gives you this experiential relationship right. to your environment that, that you know, also changes. Uh, so I think the artists that, that I see really successfully engaging the public are often sort of thinking about that mm-hmm. um, without necessarily abandoning the object. Right. But but really sort of um, incorporating it. Is there a response to them? I mean, again, don't want to essentialize everyone, but there's a certain sense of it responding to the market, that Mm. the market is so strong, Mm. and, you know, how do you not become a slave to that? Yeah. And, I mean, Um, Seagal's work, which you mentioned, where there's the experiential quality, there's also the the contract, right, Mm. which I think is a really interesting response to some of those conditions. Um, I have, which is a great segue to my final question, and then I'd love to open it up to the audience. Um, we are being simulcast to Hong Kong, I understand. So if you have a question, there will be some roving microphones. I can't actually see any of you, but there will be some <laughs> microphones um, coming down the aisles. Uh, so, so get your questions ready, and we'll have time for a couple of those before we wrap. Uh, but I have one final burning question, which is for each of you to answer, which is... Um, uh, to get us back into this, this um, the frame of sort of what is the role of these institutions in the civic life uh, of our cities, um, in, in, in maintaining a creative city, but maintaining a creative city uh, as a civic infrastructure as well. Um, wh- what do each of you see as the role and responsibility of cultural institutions to instigate and maintain cultural vitality in cities, not just within the walls, for you guys, of your um, institutions, but, but, but beyond them as well, in the broader sort of uh, neighborhood and city? What, 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 what is the role of culture and institutions in, in maintaining that cultural vitality? I'll jump in because, um, you know, Hong Kong has been such an industrious city. And I've, we've been thinking a lot about our audiences and um, in, in relation to leisure and pleasure Mm -hmm. and um, the fact that the idea of time away from work is not so distant past for many people in Hong Kong. So to have time to slow down and look and think and engage in culture is something we need to encourage. Mm So, because culture really does matter. And this, this sense, this discussion that we've been having about value is about saying this is also a value for how we see it into the future, how we think about ourselves. And spaces like museums or public um, art spaces or um, music, where we listen to music, they are experiential, of course, but they also make you think about the other parts of what make us so different from other species on Earth, Mm -hmm. this creative expression. So um, within the Hong Kong um, context, to encourage a a sense of cultural capital is um, a very important part of 
the district's aim mm -hmm. to be able to to deliver that as a as a as a sort of really important part of a civic responsibility to the people of Hong Kong who've been so um, you know industrious hard working developed a city from these little group of islands and the territory mm -hmm. huge um, work mm -hmm. but you need to balance it with a sense of other parts of one's soul yeah. and that's where culture is nourishes that mm -hmm. and I think it's a very important part of that work absolutely in that city absolutely yeah. Alex what would you say about about um, the role and responsibility of institutions and I, I must say I, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about mm -hmm. this um, I'm very, uh, very impressed and appreciate the, the fact that you have a dedicated space for rehearsal. Um, it's, you know, New York City has an unbelievable amount and diversity of places yeah. to present work. Um, but one of the biggest challenges of being a creative person in this city is finding space in which to create work mm -hmm. um, because of the, the, the value of real estate. Um, and so, anyway, but that's just one thread among many. But what do you see as, 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 your, as your responsibility to the civic life of the city writ large? Well, um, at, the, at the core of our mission, um, very deliberately, I, I put commissioning there. Mm -hmm. And commissioning coupled with a place for all art forms. Mm -hmm. So commissioning across all art forms. So that includes performing arts, visual arts, which we focused a lot on today, but performing arts, visual arts, and popular culture. And I think if you can create, and I'm only talking about our place, there's many different ways of doing this that are equally important. But the way we're doing it, or we'll do it, is that if you can, if you can control what you commission, and if you're able to commission across that range, then you can present work, make and present work that has the chance of touching a far wider range of, mm -hmm. of audiences because there's something at the very heart of each of those projects that will interest that part of the community or that part of society. And I'm not, you know, and across our year program, you know, we'll have failed if we haven't seriously widened what would be expected from mm -hmm. uh, a, an art centre or a single art form place. Um, that's one way. Um, there's many others. You know, we want to be a, a place where local, as I said, local early career artists from the five boroughs can make work. There's an experimental lab which has no other function than ex experimenting in. Um, we do not need them to show us anything at the end of it. They don't have to perform for the artistic director or the board. They have to experiment and try things out and fail and do what artists do, which is to imagine things that are not there. Um, and thirdly, um, I think with our Flex program and other programs that we'll devise, it's finding those jewels in a community or in a part of New York which has maybe not had enough opportunity and nurturing that. And those second two, let's second point, those second and third points um, can intertwine as well. Fantastic. And we can not only invest in them, but we can then show the fruits of their labors. Nicholas, take us home. I think what's, I, what's the, what's I the responsibility? Just, you know, I think um, I, on a personal level, I feel, you know, I've had a very privileged sort of upbringing where my family exposed me to art and music and culture in, in a lot of ways. And uh, so that felt like a very natural thing, but it also is something that I've kind of been devoted my professional life to because it's so enriching. And I think there are a lot of people who just don't have that access. And so, of course, it feels important to, to share that as broadly as we can. And on the, on the flip side, I also think it's really great for artists to have this incredible discipline mm -hmm. of not having a self-selected audience but having an audience that's going to be skeptical, that's going to be like, what the hell is this? Um, you know, that's really going to hold you to a very different sort of standard. And, yeah. and that- Because they're waiting for the bus. <laughs> yeah, and you know, you can't just do your usual thing. Right. And, and I see time and again, 
that that challenge actually forces artists to think differently and open new doors in their own practice that they then continue to build on. So, you know, I think it's great for the broad audience, and I think it's great for artists. Fantastic. Uh, let's open it up. I think we have time for a couple questions. Does anyone have a burning question? They'd like to, I see a hand right here. Please wait for the mic. And if you could please identify yourself. Oh, hi. Um, my name is Amy Chung, and I'm an artist from Hong Kong. I actually saw my work there. I'm very happy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. And we have been from Hong Kong um, looking forward to, to the opening of M Plus for many, many years. And uh, we're all very excited. But um, I think uh, the Hong Kong cultural landscape has changed a lot during the last five years. Um, the art market has been blooming and people are very conscious about the art and culture element of Hong Kong. But on the other hand, the political consciousness of Hong Kong people are awakening as well. A young generation of artists are very political. And I don't see a lot of political artwork you have collected, or what is Ampla's role in supporting the political participation or civic engagement of the community? It's a great question. Yeah, it's a great question. <laughs> a great question. <laughs> So I think for us it will be an engagement with artists. We're working um, with a range of artists across particular projects as they come up. I, I don't think there is any issue for us with freedom of speech. It's not a, it's it's something that's a given for us. We will always work um, with those uh, those artists. We in fact had an M plus matters that looked at the umbrella movement and what were the cultural outcomes from that? Were, were there any? How, how are they expressed? Knowing, of course, that we're not social history. So this is a fine line to, to explore in terms of what is visual culture and where does social history sit there? Because, of course, there are, as you know, museums of social history that's devoted to that in Hong Kong already doing marvelous job. The, um, you know, I have to say that the SIG collection of avant-garde Chinese art has Hong Kong artists in there. And it is, uh, um, you know, a collection that comes out of, from, from the late 70s right through to now, because we continue now to augment that collection with Hong Kong artists intersecting into greater China. And there's no question that that has deep political aspects to it, very clearly. It's there. It cannot not be there. It is absolutely there. Any other questions? One more? Yes, there in the back. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Tu, and I'm an anthropologist working at the borders of Hong Kong. So I also have a question for Ms. Raffo uh, about M+. I noticed that during your presentation, one element you emphasized quite often is this openness to this cosmopolitan influence. So mm -hmm. it provides a gateway uh, for people to come to Hong Kong and to understand Asian arts. It also provides a gateway for Asian artists to start to look beyond Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. But I feel like this narrative, if I may, seems to be ignoring this elephant in the room, which is, the location of M Plus is very unusual. It's right next to this subway, a cross-country subway station that has been very, very controversial in Hong Kong. But a lot of residents in Hong Kong see that as a territorial compromise. It sees that as, a, as this extension of a Chinese jurisdiction inside the center of Hong Kong. So they see that basically as a Chinese enclave. So I wonder how your museum will try to address the kind of conflicting emotions between a desire for territorial integrity on the one hand, and on the other hand, this desire for this openness to see the world. Um, so you're talking about the, f the rail link, the fast rail link, that, that, um, that's, that's a fact of that location. You know, that's, how, that's where the West Kowloon site is, and that's why I opened with that slide to show that there'll be, a, we are, we've been told 100,000 people a day using that station and clearly some percentage of that must be coming into the museum because people will be curious. 
I think for us, we need to understand what the audience actually is, and we are starting to explore that. Um, already in the M Plus Pavilion, we are getting um, tourists, bus, bus tourists coming in from um, Guangzhou and the Pearl River Delta as part of their tours to the region. We offer lectures and docent um, access in many languages, English, Cantonese, and Mandarin. And I think we can't ignore those audiences. It is a fact of that region that we're going to have to respond and be responsive. But I think to be open is really important because to, cl to close a door is to diminish something. So it's, it's very, very important to face discuss and think about what those relationships will be. What we do in our museum crosses many areas of um, not just the region but out into the big world. And I think that is the basis of a productive, constructive, open-ended conversation because to close a door like I said, it's, it's, a, it's a mistake. That would be a, a deep mistake. So I think that's a really wonderful note to end on. We've heard a lot tonight about openness, mm -hmm. about responsiveness, about flexibility and porosity, um, and how those sort of themes in the presentation of art and cultural life and, um, and culture more broadly interface with some of these institutional questions mm -hmm. about how you um, actually act as a responsible citizen, as a cultural institution in these incredibly complex times that are sometimes so complex we can barely even stand it, <laughs> particularly in this country. Um, but I think we should end there with a big round of applause for our brilliant panelists. So I just want to add one more thing. Thank you so much, yes. Kazim. That was incredible. And, and, you know, since we're talking about elephants in the room, um, you know, the assumption, I think, up until about a year ago was that globalism was a given. Mm. That, that a perspective of be, being global and that even that idea of gateways, that that, that kind of, of uh, transport as, as an overriding metaphor for how we live our lives was a given. And recently, we've been hearing that, in fact, there are people who are quite prominent who are anti-global. That, that in fact this idea that, that, and it's not just global or global, or, it's, it's about as if we could have those barriers. So I think as we think about cities, um, it becomes really critical. <coughs> and, and also, and unfortunately we didn't have time to get into this, you know, more and more you see with the relationship between cities rather than nation states. Mm. There's a, a whole other kind of dynamic. So it's, it's interesting, actually, for those of us who work in the arts, in fact, there is a kind of dynamic between people who are in that, that space where we are in some way mediating with artists and, and our communities. And those communities may be geographic or they may be virtual. But I just think it, it, it's what's so interesting tonight is to, to see that we've sort of started looking at that uh, dynamic, and we didn't we didn't have the time to completely explore it. And yet, if you think about concepts that were, you know, put out tonight, um, you see that there is a, a kind of interdependence of of uh, work that's going on, whether it's the artists, the audiences, or those who are in in the, what we can say is a privileged space of trying to make things make those connections. So join me again and give a big hand. Thank you, Thank you all.